Today we will learn and reflect on the work in the Philokalia by St. Mark the Ascetic, No Righteousness by Works, proving that the debate between faith and works is a debate that's been ongoing since the beginning of Christianity and indeed since Paul penned Romans. In St. Peter 3 we read that there are some things in St. Paul's epistles that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do to the other scriptures. Now there was a question in our discussion group for this video whether the Protestant Reformation would have happened had Luther been aware of these teachings of the Eastern Church Fathers. Now that's a very good question. Luther lived before the Renaissance which reintroduced the Greek philosophers to the Western tradition. But there's no indication that Luther was acquainted with any of the monastic writings of the early Eastern Church Fathers. At the end of our talk we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. During my Lutheran catechetical classes as a youth, I formed the impression that Luther discovered grace, the true doctrine that men could not be made righteous by works, the doctrine that was lacking in Catholicism and indeed lost since the days that St. Paul penned the epistle to the Romans, which proclaims, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, The one who is righteous will live by faith. And in Luther's original translation, he translated that as faith alone. But subsequent Protestant Bibles omit that. Now, Luther was not the first to debate grace and justification. Most knowledgeable Lutherans will remind you that much of Lutheran theology is a reinterpretation of St. Augustine's doctrine of grace and predestination when St. Augustine was preaching against the errors of the Pelagians. The distance between the Lutheran and Catholic positions are not as great as many believe. Recently, both these churches have agreed upon a joint declaration on their beliefs on justification by faith. After St. Augustine, debates similar to the Protestant Catholic doctrinal matters on subjects like the true nature of the sacraments and on faith versus works and the role that grace plays in salvations were raging during the Carolingian Renaissance in Charlemagne's kingdom. The works of St. Mark the Ascetic were treasured by the monks of Mount Athos, and the common advice was to sell all you have and buy St. Mark the monk. St. Mark and all the writers of the Philokalia urge us to keep the gospel clear and central to all our acts of Christian obedience, that the gospel should be at the center of Christian spirituality. Mark's message is that all ascetic efforts of prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and church life will be dangerously misguided without a prior understanding of the free gift of grace as the foundation for all Christian living. Now, before we review this work for ourselves, we will review the discussion of this work by St. Mark the Ascetic in an excellent essay by Bradley Nassif in the Philokalia, a classic text of Orthodox spirituality. Nassif notes that the difference between these debates hinges on differences in languages and translations. Nassif observes, in Reformation polemics, the debate centered on whether or not the scriptures use the word justify to denote divine acquittal of a believer through a legal declaration of being made right with God, and that's uh, Luther's and Calvin's position, or uh, the Catholic position, or a believer who is made holy through moral acts of righteous behavior in the Council of Trent. Now this distinction, so crucial in Protestant Catholic debates, is never debated in the Greek patristic tradition. And the Greek word for justify also means righteous, with no theological difference implied. Now, Nassif observes that salvation is a free gift of grace. It is not a reward for righteous deeds. And St. Mark the Ascetic teaches that salvation is like a slave redeemed from slavery. A slave does not demand freedom as a reward, but rather satisfies his master as someone who is indebted to him and who waits for his freedom as a gift. And I want to just stop here. The paragraph numbers that he uses are a little bit off from our version of the Philokalia that we recommend because he uses a different version. Anyway, good works are always good. 
Every good work that we do through our own nature causes us to abstain from its opposing evil, but without grace it cannot increase our holiness. We should always search our heart for upright and humble motives. St. Mark the Ascetics warns that some, without keeping the commandments, think that they are keeping the faith, while others, keeping the commandments, expect to receive the kingdom as a reward owed to them. Both are deprived of the kingdom. Our reward lies in our humble obedience, and our salvation is our striving to live a more godly life. And salvation is not a transaction. Salvation is not bartering. Salvation is a gift by grace, unearned. St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us, when the scriptures say God will reward each person according to his works, the scriptures are not saying that works deserve hell or the kingdom, but rather that works are done out of faith or lack of faith in him. Christ repays each person not as a businessman fulfilling his contracts, but as God, our creator and redeemer, out of his love for us, not out of bartered obligations. And Nassif clarifies, Good works are a necessary means of guarding or protecting the purity of our salvation that has been granted in baptism. But they should never lead us to think that God will repay us for them. Perhaps our very capacity to perform good works is itself a gift of grace from God, as is certainly our very existence as sons of God who have the ability to ponder such imponderables. And Nassif sees three consequences of our conversion through baptism. First, good works are a response of gratitude rooted in the spiritual law, or the law of freedom. Second, grace is secretly hidden in the heart of the baptized, but requires keeping the commandments in order for that grace to be consciously revealed in the heart of the believer. And third, ascetical labors are the duties of sonship and faithful service to Christ. What does that first point mean, that good works are a response of gratitude rooted in the spiritual law or the law of freedom? Every day we are free to choose whether we wish to perform good works or the opposite. When we choose darkness and hedonistic pleasures, we lose our freedom to our addictions. We become bitter and angry and resentful. But when we choose purity and light, our freedom grows through our obedience, and we are gracious and grateful to all whom we meet. Now, how beautiful is St. Mark the Ascetic's description of grace. We would all benefit from a careful reading of this long paragraph. Grace has been mystically bestowed on those who have been baptized in Christ. This grace becomes active in them to the extent that they keep the commandments. Grace never ceases to secretly help us, but it is up to us, as far as it lies within our own power, to do good or not to do good. And grace first rouses the conscience in a manner that conforms to God's wishes. That is how even evildoers have repented and come to please God. Again, grace may be hidden in a neighbor's advice. There are times when grace accompanies one's thoughts when one is reading, but as a natural consequence, teaches the mind the truth about itself. If therefore we do not hide the talent that has in consequence been given to us, we shall without a doubt enter into the Lord's joy. And we should be generous in our good works. St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us, we who have been considered worthy to receive the washing of regeneration, offer good works not as a repayment, but as a means of preserving the purity that has been given to us. And the goal of grace is to love as God loves. And Asif observes that true humility does not lead to self-praise or to self-condemnation, but to gratitude. As St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us, humility consists not in condemning our conscience, but in recognizing God's grace and compassion. Nassif further observes, the aim of the ascetic life is not to merit the kingdom of God or to engage in great ascetical feats as if they were ends in themselves, but to love as God loves. That is why grace opposes merit while including the hard work of holiness. The final goal is to cultivate love for God and others through the practice of inner silence. And by saying the Jesus prayer, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. As St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us, the most comprehensive of all the commandments is to love God and love our neighbor, which is maintained by abstaining from material things and through stillness in one's thoughts. Now, we're going to read the famous work for ourselves for more insights in living a godly life. St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us, it is always better to follow the commandments than not follow them, as acting kindly is a good habit to acquire. 
But those who expect rewards or recognition for living a godly life easily fall into other traps the deceiver places under their feet. St. Mark the ascetic teaches us, He who does something good and expects a reward is serving not God but his own will. And we all know the certainty of death and the uncertainty of life. But with modern medicine, we forget so easily that life can be snatched from us so randomly and so suddenly from any of us at any time, anywhere, no matter how godly a life we lead. If we expect rewards for living a godly life, then we may find anger at God welling up in our souls for God not living up to his end of our deal. Now God promises strength for us to endure our sufferings, and God grants us the grace that allows us the kindness that makes life meaningful. But does God promise protection from all of life's sufferings and trials? Well, not so much. Suffering can strengthen our character, as St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us. He who has come to know the truth does not oppose the afflictions that befall him, for he knows that they lead him to the fear of God. Trials come upon us because of our former sins, bringing what is appropriate to each offense. How can we know that our sufferings are brought upon us by our former sins? Sometimes our sufferings come from a lack of trust from others who were hurt many years ago or whose parents whose hurts they inherited, which is another reason to readily forgive our neighbor. St. Mark the ascetic teaches us, He who willingly accepts chastening by affliction is not dominated by evil thoughts against his will, whereas he who does not accept affliction is taken prisoner by evil thoughts even though he resists them. And that leads us to question, does grace make us puppets? St. Mark the ascetic teaches us, Grace has been given mystically to those who have been baptized into Christ, and it becomes active within them to the extent that they actively observe the commandments. Grace never ceases to help us secretly, but to do good, as far as lies in our own power, depends on us. And St. Mark the ascetic also teaches us, when we fulfill the commandments in our outward actions, we receive from the Lord what is appropriate, but any real benefit we gain depends on our inward intention. When we live a godly life, the immediate reward is the living of the godly life. Salvation is promised in the next life for our living a godly life, as St. Mark the ascetic teaches us. Fear of hell and love for God's kingdom enable us patiently to accept affliction. And this they do, not by themselves, but through him who knows our thoughts. However, salvation can be attained in this life when we are transformed into godly people, adopted sons of our Father in heaven. Luke reminds us, once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For, in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. St. Mark continues, Christ is master by virtue of his own essence and master by virtue of his incarnate life. For Christ creates man from nothing and through his own blood redeems him when dead in sin and to those who believe in him he has given his grace. When scripture says he will reward every man according to his works, do not imagine that works in themselves merit either hell or the kingdom. On the contrary, Christ rewards each man according to whether his works are done with faith or without faith in himself. And he is not a dealer bound by contract, but is rather God our creator and redeemer. And there is another interesting teaching by St. Mark the ascetic. If we want to do something but cannot, then before God, who knows our hearts, it is as if we have done it. This is true whether the intended action is good or bad. And motives matter and motives are all that matter. And this is a comforting teaching to those in divorce support groups. They hear the need to forgive and reconcile, but you find it difficult to forgive someone close to you whom you thought loved and cared for you, but who instead cheats and turns on you and tries to destroy your life. As a facilitator, you can ask if the divorce process is still ongoing, and if so, tell them not to be too hard on them themselves, because it's sometimes impossible to forgive while the battle is still being waged. Now, forgiveness is a decision, as is love, but for grievous and egregious sins, forgiveness is also a process. And perhaps you can recast the verse, I believe, help my unbelief, too, I forgive, help me to forgive. And in these situations, reconciliation is both a decision and a process. Often it simply means being less angry and kinder to them today than you were yesterday. 
Striving to forgive and reconcile, even when it is difficult or even impossible, makes us better people, brings salvation slowly into our soul. Is salvation more self-discipline than reward? St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us, even though knowledge is true, it is still not firmly established if unaccompanied by works, for everything is established by being put into practice. We should not become angry with God when those close to us try to destroy our lives. St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us, it is a great virtue to accept patiently whatever comes, and as the Lord enjoins, to love a neighbor who hates you. And the sign of sincere love is to forgive wrongs done to us. It was with such love that the Lord loved the world. Rain cannot fall without a cloud, and we cannot please God without a good conscience. We must always strive to love and forgive and be reconciled with our neighbor. And St. Mark the Ascetic is known for his early writings on prayer. There is no perfect prayer unless the intellect invokes God, and when our thought cries aloud, without distraction, the Lord will listen. Prayer is called a virtue, but in reality it is the mother of virtues, for prayer gives birth to them through union with Christ. Whatever we do without prayer and without hope in God turns out afterwards to be harmful and defective. Prayer, like living a godly life and following the commandments, is a discipline. Love of God through prayer should lead us to love our neighbor through our actions. St. Mark the Ascetic teaches us about praying. Pray persistently about everything, and then you will never do anything without God's help. Nothing is stronger than prayer in action. Nothing is more effective in winning God's favor. Prayer comprises the complete fulfillment of the commandments, for there is nothing higher than love for God. Undistracted prayer is a sign for love for God, but careless or distracted prayer is a sign of love for pleasure. And the same could be said for church services. Escape from temptation through patience and prayer. If you oppose temptation without these, it only attacks you more strongly. St. Mark the Ascetic sums up the dangers of not living an examined life. He who does not understand God's judgments walks on a ridge like a knife edge and is easily unbalanced by every puff of wind. When praised, he exults. When criticized, he feels bitter. When he feasts, he makes a pig of himself. And when he suffers hardship, he moans and groans. When he understands, he shows off. And when he does not understand, he pretends like he does, like a consultant. When rich, he is boastful, and when in poverty, he plays the hypocrite. Gorged, he grows brazen, and when he fasts, he becomes arrogant. He quarrels with those who reprove him, and those who forgive him he regards as fools. And we will conclude this reflection with the comforting thought of St. Mark the Ascetic. Fire cannot last long in water, nor can a shameful thought in a heart that loves God. For every man who loves God suffers gladly, and voluntary suffering is by nature the enemy of sensual pleasure. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. This work by St. Mark the Ascetic is found in Volume 1 of the Philokalia, and we also recommend this book covering the Philokalia, which we quoted from extensively. We also have a video on the history of the Philokalia and a companion video on St. Mark the Ascetic. And we also have a link to the Mystagogy website that has many of the saints' pictures we use, and also has some interesting excerpts from the writings of our saints, and the church whose icons we use for this video, St. George's Antiochian Orthodox Church in Coral Gables near Miami, and we have the unobstructed thumbnail picture of the monastery on Mount Athos. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.